Now we're ready to start the real thing in RN. I uh, gave you a, a primer in terms of what the, these operators Z and C do in going from RN to RN plus 1. Now let's start showing what we need to show. So this is a good time to go back to the other video if you want to do this yourself and see what the statements of the questions are and not the, not the answers. But here I'm going to give away the answers. The first thing is to show that, D, that Z and C commute with the D operator. Um, very, very basic kind of thing in this, in this business. It's a very general thing. Um, so let's just, this, those are just calculations. You just have to be careful about uh, things like uh, indices and the J's and the P's and the N's and where you're evaluating things. So DZ just means, okay, Z of a, of a form, remember that means just restrict to set X plus N plus 1 equals 0. And if, um, if the last coordinate is an n plus one, then it's just going to be zero, and that's a pretty trivial case that we're not really going to not going to have to do. You can do it especially if you want, okay? But we're going to assume that the last coordinate isn't the n plus one, um, and we're going to do z dz of one of these building block forms. Remember, if I can show that dz equals zd on each of these building blocks, then it's going to be true for the sum, and so that's going to be true for all of these things. We're going to look at the pieces, and then linearity is going to take care of the rest. So uh, if I z one of these guys, then I set the last coordinate to be 0. I don't touch these since there's not, not a dx n plus 1 in there. And then d of something is the sum of all the partial derivatives. Now this is d in rn, remember. z actually has gone from rn plus 1 to rn. So it's only a sum of 1 up to n of all the partial derivatives, x1 through xn. And then we put in a dxi and put in this guy. Now, you might be wondering, do I have to keep track of whether the i matches one of these indices? Not really. If the i matches one of these indices, it's going to be 0, but it's OK. We don't have to treat that specially, which is really, really nice. And that's the nice thing about forms is a lot of the time you can put this in, and yeah, maybe a lot of these are going to die. Who cares? It's going to be OK. Now let's calculate zd, on the other hand. Now, the d here is acting on a form that's in rn plus 1. So it's going to be the sum of the partial derivatives of x1 all the way up through the n plus 1 variable of this function of all the variables through n plus 1 not set to 0, dxi wedge all these guys. But then I'm going to z it. Well, remember, what does z do? It kills anything that has a dxn plus 1. So in fact, even though this actually did calculate that partial derivative, it's going to die with the z. The sum is going to become a sum up to n. And I'm, going to, and I'm just going to get exactly this formula that I got before with the, the xn plus 1 set to 0. So really, this can't sort of fail to, to work, uh, because z is such a simple thing to do. And in fact, in a later video, I'll show you how uh, we kind of already knew that this would work if we, if we just have a different perspective on z. Now, c, OK. c, remember, stretches a form on rn, R, R, on RN and produces a, a constant form, or a form that's constant in the new variable on rn plus 1. Here, I have to be careful about the point of evaluation. So it's kind of ironic that the left-hand side, the thing I'm trying to define, is actually longer on the page than what I'm actually defining it to be. This says, take a a building block form, some function times a certain wedge of the, of the x, xj's, take the c of that, and then I need to be explicit about where I'm evaluating that. That's an x1 through an arbitrary xn plus 1. And of course I do that by not by ignoring the xn plus 1 and just writing down the formula I had before for it in rn. Okay, now, dc of something of that form. Well, evaluate at xn plus n plus 1. Wow, this is getting big. OK, well, C just says, write down the same formula that you had in Rn, in Rn plus 1. It will automatically be constant in n plus, the xn plus 1 variable. Then take D of that. So that's the sum of all the different derivatives, partial derivatives times the new dxi wedged into what was before. But once again, this guy's constant in the n plus 1 variable. So the sum collapses down to just i equals n plus 1 to n. OK, so it's going to be partial derivatives, dxi. And again, some of these i's might match, and it doesn't matter. The, they'll be equal in this. And if there's zero here, there'll be zero here. Now, what about the other direction? If I take d first, there I'm taking the d in the Rn, definitely only from one to n in the partial derivatives, dxi, but it's very very similar. And then I see it. Well, what does c do? It says says write down exactly the same formula, but just remember that you're in Rn plus one now, and it just happens to not depend on xn plus one. Guess what? It's the same thing again because very very little has been done. Okay, now. K is definitely going to be more complicated. That's the heart of the thing. So remember what K does is it does this integral in the last variable 
um, unless the last variable isn't there, in which case it just kills it. Okay, so this is where it's going to be a bit different from the previous proof. In the previous proof, we assumed that if that alpha was closed, and we wanted to show that just plain dk alpha was what we needed to make up the gap between the real alpha and its sort of squished and restretched version, its artificially simplified version. Well, the problem is, with all these indices r running around, it'd be a pain to do the analog of the assumption that alpha was closed. Remember, when alpha was closed in the previous one, that amounted to these explicit equalities and partial derivatives. You could do it that way, but it would be a mess, and there's actually a much better way to do it, which we could have done in the previous problem, to be honest. And that is to not assume that alpha is closed. And it turns out that even if alpha is not closed, we get something very interesting. It says alpha is its squished and stretched simplification, plus or minus, and the sign is explicit. We'll figure that out. A clo an exact form, dk alpha, so that's d of something. That's exactly what we want, OK? But then minus k of d alpha. Now, it happens to be, of course, that if alpha is closed, this thing will die. So you might think, how is this improvement? Here's the big thing. Here's the, the first hint that I give. If you don't have to assume that alpha is closed, we can actually do it like we were doing it in the previous a couple of minutes on one little piece, one building block at a time. One function times one combination of the dxj's. Something that's just this simple will almost never be closed in itself because closed implies that the one partial derivative of one component cancels out the partial derivative of another component just like we saw in the previous problem. But we're not going to have to assume that alpha is closed, so we're going to be able to prove this on the building blocks and then use linearity to show that it's true on all, all alpha. That is a huge, huge improvement. Okay. Um, then the other hints are it's going to break into cases. Surprise, surprise. All of these three definitions of C, Z, and K depend on whether you were including the xn plus 1 in the dx's or not. And then another hint is we might want to try a little more warm up. Um, going a little more complicated than we did before. So, for example, going from R3 to R4 with a two form and try the two cases, one where we do include, don't include our x4, dx4, and one where we do include dx4. So let me go ahead and do that warm up first, and then we'll, in the next video, we'll, we'll do the real thing. Okay, so let me just bring this back up into place. Okay. So if you close your eyes and stop the video and rewind if you don't want to see this done for you. Well, this one, when we don't have the x4 variable, some of it simplifies um, right off the bat. Because k, let's go back to the k definition. Remember, k of something, if I don't include the last variable, in this case x4, that just dies. So dk is just going to be dead here. OK. What about kd of f dx1, dx2? What is dx2? Now, when necessary, I'm going to include the evaluation point. But I'm only going to include it when necessary, just to simplify stuff. I could put an x1 through x4 here if I wanted to. OK. So what's the d of this? Partial derivative with respect to x3, partial with respect to x4. I don't need the x1 and x2 because they would automatically die, although I could put them in. Uh, it's OK. All right. Um, and so I'm, and just to get the, the things in order, I switched it. It happens to not include any signs here um, because the, the x4 and the x3 went past two things. OK, not a big deal, but I wanted to get this in last because I have to get this in last position. These are supposed to be in order for this definition to work with the right sign. So it's k of all this stuff. Well, k of something without an x4, that's going to die. This one is going to be active. So we're going to get the integral from 0 to x4 of this function, the derivative with respect to x4, evaluated at x1, x2, x3, and t, dt, and then times what's whatever's left without the dx4, which is dx1, which dx2. Hey, that's where the partial, that's where the fundamental theorem comes in. That's going to be just f evaluated at x1 through x4 minus f evaluated at x1, x2, x3, 0, and then times the dx1 wedge dx2. OK, well, um, so certainly f dx1 wedge dx2, that's what we started with. If that's alpha, then that's just going to be alpha here. And then it's pretty easy to see that this part, the f evaluated at 0 times dx1 wedge dx2, that's what happens if I take z of it. That's what creates the 0. And then I restretch it um, to become a form, a form back on R4. So this is exactly just the smushed and restretched version of f. It's cz of this guy. So I've got my form minus cz. Okay. So, in other, so dk minus kd here, dk minus kd of this thing, 
oh, let's just call it alpha, is indeed going to be um, alpha minus CZ alpha. Okay. And um, let's see. Do I have the sign right? I think I have the sign right. If I don't, if I, the sign looks weird though. Oh, right. Well, let's see. So P, if this is a two form, and for some reason this, uh, the sign seems to be weird, but you know what? I'll leave that to the listener to see if the sign is correct or if I need, I might have bobbled the sign somewhere. It's not a big deal. I don't want to redo the whole video. Now, let's do the other case. I was a little more careful in the other case because it is more complicated. What if you did include x4? So suppose alpha was f dx3 wedge dx4. Now I have to be careful from the start about the evaluation point. Oops, this is going to be tricky. Uh, sorry. Okay, now it's all on the screen. Okay, so dk. Well, I'm going to leave the d out to be evaluated here. Okay. Um, oh, I really should put that in parentheses there. Okay. So k says integrate f with a variable last variable from 0 to x4 times whatever's left over when you strip off the dx4, which is dx3. Okay. So that's going to be uh, three derivatives now. d by dx1 of that times dx1 which dx3, d by dx2, d by dx4, and we don't need a dx3 because that would die. Okay. So notice that there's th these two we can do the trick of passing the, the derivative inside the integral sign because this is not the variable of integration x1. So I passed it in here. That's all I did here. d by dx2 I passed it in here. Here is the fundamental theorem where I take the derivative of an integral and that's just going to be f of x1 through x4 dx4 which dx3. Okay. So so far so good. That's dk. Not sure what to make of it yet. But let's do kd. Okay. kd of the same form. Well, d is going to take df dx1 and df dx2. We don't need the three or four derivatives in this case. Okay. And I'm going to k that. Well, guess what? Uh, so these both involve an x4, so they're both going to live. And so we're going to get the integral of df dx1 with, it's this three form with the dx4 stripped off. And then integral of df dx2 is this three form with the dx4 stripped off. Look at these. Look at the comparison here. These are exactly the same. The only thing that's not matching is this guy. So dk minus kd, everything cancels out. Voila, except for the f. It happens to be dx4 wedge dx3. That's opposite from what I want, what I started. So I get a minus sign. Well, that's good because it was a two form. Here, the sign really is working out correctly. And I think I probably messed it up in the previous one. So dk minus kd of alpha is indeed minus 1 to the p minus 1 alpha minus cz alpha. Why is it minus cz alpha? Remember, if the alpha started out with a dx4, the z kills it right away. And so this is really minus 1 to the p minus 1 times alpha, but that's the same thing as alpha minus cz alpha. In general, you do have to subtract off the cz alpha, that, as we saw in the, uh, in the previous one. Okay, so this is, we're pretty warmed up. We're ready to go with like the JPs and all the, the massive generality now that we've seen the pattern in various cases. And that's what we'll do in the next video.